So as we dive into the content, um, I did mention last week that you're going to see some differences in concepts and sequence in the publisher provided slides versus the study guide, right? And one of the things to keep in mind, so there's this, there's this uh, preface to the study guide where I, I talk about system security and how your systems perspective, and it gets back to the whole point I made about the Q code, the 3D printed Q code, right? That, um, and then just to be consistent, I don't know if you remember, we may or may not have had each other in introduction to cybersecurity. Your mileage may vary. You may have had uh, Dr. Francois for intro to cybersecurity. Sometimes the terminology for security interests with introductory courses and other authors or subject matter experts, they love to use the word vulnerability and threat. I don't like that view of things. Uh, well, it's a useful view of things and, and it, does, it does help you grasp some essential concepts, but I really like this idea of exposures and exploits, right? So if you have an exposure, there may be an exploit that knows how to take advantage of the gap in security, the exposure, but that doesn't mean that anybody is there an actor, a malicious actor, is present to perform the exploit. So you have like three levels of dynamic there in the picture. And after working cybersecurity for 20 years in industry, there's the textbook version of how to describe things, but then there's like the real world version. So you got to have a malicious actor in the environment to exploit something, uh, to use the exploit but there may not be an exploit for a given exposure, right? And I, I just think that it is, now you notice this right here, everybody sees this highlight, right? Everybody? Um, you're not sharing. I'm not sharing? Oh, uh, but I am recording, I think. Yeah, yeah, you're recording. Yeah. Okay, so I was gesturing on the screen. Well, when you see the recording, it's all there. I was, I was showing the difference between vulnerability exploit and exposure uh, while I was talking. This is the part I want you to see here. It is technically incorrect to call an attack exploit. an exploit. Now I know that sounds like a minor distinction, but remember that you have an exposure which can be called a vulnerability, oh, no. right? People overuse the term vulnerability all the time. The exposure uh, could have a method, there could be a method devised to take advantage of the exposure or gap in security. The exploit method that can take advantage of the gap or exposure may or may not be performed by a malicious actor. An attack is when an exploit is used by a malicious actor to take advantage of a gap in security or exposure. To call an exploit an attack is technically incorrect. But you see this all the time in literature. Our discipline, cybersecurity, is so new and, and there are so many up and coming subject matter experts and they all have their own way of viewing uh, the world through their own lenses. And I'm sorry, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm an old, I'm like an old drill sergeant. I've been in the trenches for 20 years and I've worked it in the real world. And when you're in, when you're in a technology department and you're dealing with the real world, um, you can read journal articles about vulnerabilities and, and exploits, meaning attacks, but and then they say that, uh, I mean, the word exploit could be a noun or a verb. You could say I've been exploited, which would technically be the same as an attack, right? 
So there are some semant it's it seems like semantics. It's like I'm slicing, splitting hairs, but you're going to find that as we look at systems security, we have to dis we have to discriminate between what's a gap in the security, which we call an exposure. What is the method that can be used to take advantage of such an exposure? And then whether or not a malicious actor is, is a malicious actor present in the environment? Oh my gosh, that raises the threat level. So you could have a threat level where it's pretty high. Does the malicious actor actually possess the skills to, to use the exploit? Well, they could learn at your expense and it might be painful and eventually they break in as opposed to a gifted malicious actor who is very skilled, that's where the threat level goes through the roof. So, so when I talk about threats, I tend to think in terms of like traditional military uh, points of view, right? And again, it, it, it may seem like semantics, but I wanna call this out with you up front. And I'm gonna try to trick you on the assessment with this question right here. I'm gonna use it incorrectly. And I hope after what we've just explained, you'll say, nope. Okay. Now, here's the other thing that's another dynamic of system security. You can be attacked by a malicious actor who uses an exploit for a corresponding exposure. Everybody with me so far? Yes. Okay. But so what if they're successful? what's the impact of the successful attack? If all they did was, oh, they forced a reboot of your system and 60 seconds later, you're back in business. Okay, that's a nuisance issue, but it doesn't bring you to a screeching halt, does it? If instead the system that was attacked is critically important because it's a resource or an asset involved in what? How you make your living. If what's attacked in that case, prevents you from collecting your proceeds, your revenue, your income, how you do your business, you're screwed. In that case, the impact for a successful attack, given the resource, so there are all these facets to consider. Okay, I have an exposure, what's involved? Is it an asset that matters? Or is my exposure something that's trivial? Okay. Would it be a serious exposure if a hacker knew my MAC address for my network device. Well, it depends on who I am and what I do and where I, where I associate. How costly was this loss, right? How many of you have heard the HBO? Have we shared the HBO hack yet? No, I have not heard of it. Okay. Anybody hear of his HBO series called Game of Thrones? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you've ever seen Game of Thrones or, or started to watch it, it's pretty addictive, right? There's a whole cult following. And of course, people have collections of Game of Thrones discs and they or they stream it on high def because they love it. You know, there's all these cool things about Game of Thrones. It's almost like Harry Potter. Here's the thing. In season five or six, some hackers couldn't break in to the HBO headquarters. Instead, they figured out a way to break into a senior VP's home. They got onto his home network because he had a work laptop at home on his home network where he wasn't thinking about security, systems security. He was only thinking about, oh, I got I to gotta do work at home. Now he's on his home network, which isn't protected as much. They infected his work laptop. And as soon as he connected inside HBO while he was at work on site at the office, boom, now the HBO network is compromised. The hackers got away with the next season of Game of Thrones before it was released. And they threatened, they blackmailed them and said, if you don't, they attempted to blackmail. If you don't give us $50 million in Bitcoin, we're going to release it on the internet before your season starts. Sucks to be you. 
HBO leadership said, screw you. We don't deal with terrorists. We don't care. HBO lost 75 million in residuals. Because by the time the season rolled out, nobody was watching their, nobody was on screen watching each episode each week, which meant, which meant the advertisers and the other ads that were associated with that release, that series, right? That ongoing season, nobody tuned in. You didn't get, a, you didn't get eyes on a screen. Nobody, nobody, for season six, nobody could care less. HBO lost 75 million in revenues for the residuals that year. Who'd have thought? They had no clue. This is actually a well-documented case, right? So what about countermeasures? Well, you know, the thing is, senior leadership of an organization with serious assets, um, yeah, you might have some policies that require employees when they bring office equipment home that they have to use certain security measures on their home network. You might actually have to think about implementing something like that, okay? All right. We need to review some time-honored operational tenets of cybersecurity just to make sure everybody's on the same page. You, as I stated before, you may have had intro to cyber with Dr. Francois, or you may have had intro to cyber with me. So let's dive in. We're going to describe the three, the key security requirements for confidentiality, integrity, and availability types, provide examples of system and network threats and attacks. We've already done that in our discussion summarize the functional requirements for system security, right? So without further ado, um, I'm gonna stop every now and then and ask if there's a question, please feel free to jump in at any point. So confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, we want you to be able to explain what those are. So measures and controls, they ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So these are standard definitions according to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST for short. We'll be talking about NIST standards, specifically those that are promulgated or um, distributed as a special publication. There's a series, 800 series, has to do with cybersecurity. NIST SP 800. If you see that, it has to do with cyber. It has to do with systems security, one facet or another. In international standards organizations, if you're dealing with an international audience or context, ISO standards 27,000 series, anything with a 27 followed by three numbers, 27,001, 001, 27,000, 002, and so on. The 27,000 series in ISO have to do with cybersecurity standards. Here you see that, and this is one nuisance issue uh, that we're facing right now. We have confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But then you also have this thing called AAA. It's related. It has to do with accountability, availability, and authenticity. Yeah, no, it isn't. AAA stands for something else in different cybersecurity manuals. Authentication, access control, and uh, authentication, access control, and auditing is AAA. So it's easy to get confused. What I want you to understand is that there's a lot of related concepts, but we start with confidentiality, integrity, and availability. In the British or UK United Kingdom system, they're actually, A stands for, it has to do, it isn't availability. It has to do with, um, and it's not authenticity, it's something else. Anyway, we're not in the UK. So when we talk about confidentiality, we're talking about keeping things a secret, unauthorized eyes. Integrity means uh, nobody's modified the information. I did not change the date of your payment due. So you would default on your credit card. And now I would now I get to charge you 30% interest instead of 3% interest, right? 
availability. Um, I can't use it. The screen is so slow. I can't get any work done. So these are key security concepts. That's what we mean by these three. Any questions about CIA? This should be review. Everybody should be fairly familiar with CIA, at least from intro to cyber. Yes? Hello? Yes. OK, good. We talked about impact. You have to consider the impact when you have an exposure and an exploit and a malicious actor and they have the skills and the opportunity and they use it, they're going to impair or afflict some damage to an asset. We have to ask ourselves, okay, now that that's happened, what's the impact to the organization? Does it keep you from doing what you need to do to survive? Um, low, moderate, and high, right? So a high loss, a high level of impact would be the loss could be expected to have severe or catastrophic adverse effects on organizational operations, organizational assets, or individuals. Do you think anyone at HBO could even imagine when they got that email, you must submit $50 million in Bitcoin. Do you think anybody would have thought it would be better to pay the 50 million? Nobody would have guessed, right? Nobody has a crystal ball. These are some of the things that we're dealing with here. It helps to be able to frame how exposures and potential risk, we're really talking about how to frame a view of potential risks that you can make informed decisions. So computer security challenges, here you see a laundry list of, okay, it's not as simple as it might first appear to the novice, and developing a particular security mechanism or algorithm, one must always consider potential attacks on those security features. Procedures are used, used to provide particular services are often counterintuitive. So they're things that don't, aren't obvious at first, right? These are all restatements of what we've just explained in our examples. It's a good thing to know these. Security is still too often an afterthought to be incorporated into a system after it's designed instead of up front. Hey, here's a thought. HBO puts their um, season production in a vault that's air gapped. It's not connected to the network. So hackers can't get it. Lots of extra detail on these slides. Yeah, I've distilled many of them. For cases, I want to I want to share this with you. You see a lot of definitions here. You're going to see definitions listed in the appendix or addendum. So this study guide has an addendum, and I wanted you to be aware that there's an addendum for the study guide. Uh, it should be on. It should be in there under the references folder. Okay. All right, so this diagram can be helpful as a graphical representation of the things I just walked through with you in our example. You have assets that belong to owners. They have controls or countermeasures to minimize the exposure, right, to an asset. You have exposures to an asset or a resource there may be exploits. There are threat agents, I like to call them malicious actors, that can perform these things depending on their skill level and the exposure, the proximity of exposure, the duration of exposure, right? All sorts of factors there. You have to consider what's happening with the assets. When certain dynamics of that scenario change, the risk goes through the roof. So threat index is another way of thinking of risk. The goal in our system security course and in any cybersecurity course is to reduce risk. It's a risk management proposition. If you didn't have me in intro to cyber, I'm hoping that, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Francois would have told you Risk management is a way to translate technical cyber interests into dollars and cents that finance and admin people can appreciate. 
when I first started my formal studies in cybersecurity for my advanced degree in cybersecurity, I had to take some risk management courses and I thought, this is stupid. I, I don't want to get into the business world. I'm very glad I did because I had all sorts of technical gar jargon to share with people. And when I tried to talk to finance and admin types who made the decisions, they couldn't appreciate anything I was saying. But if I put it in terms of a threat to their asset, then they suddenly understood. It's like, okay, here's a way to translate this exposure. This countermeasure is needed to reduce an exposure because you think I'm a techie, I'm a nerd? No, that's not it. This asset that you use to collect a million dollars a day, that doesn't work anymore. How many days can you afford to go without a million dollars a day in revenue? Do you, think, do you think you can afford $5,000 to seal off the exposure so your a million dollars a day keeps happening? How's that for risk management? That's clarity. And what we have to do is translate technical stuff in ways that users can appreciate. That's part of system security. We don't have systems that operate unto themselves. Systems have owners and users. That's something to keep in mind. Just like the layers of networking, when we talk about the physical layer and we talk about the application, the operating systems layer and the software layer, there's a similar kind of thing in cybersecurity. One of the things I want you to appreciate is that hackers are gifted at getting in between those layers. Usually when we have an, an unexpected exposure and exploit and gifted attack, what's happened is that everybody's got their hardware locked down, they have software up to date, they've got encryption for their data, but they're not thinking about the gaps in between those components. Many of our exploits and gifted attacks by malicious actors occur in the gaps between the areas that people, everybody knows, oh, I got network security to think about. Yeah, you do. But did you, um, did you turn off your near field communication on your smartphone? Did you turn off your Bluetooth? How about Zigbee? You know, it's a short distance wireless that they use to collect like utility meter information when people come by to route to read how much power you've used. It's called Zigbee. It's on, it's always on, you know? 20 bucks in Amazon means you can get a device, you plug into a USB port and now you're reading everybody's meter. It's not Wi-Fi, it's not Bluetooth, it's not near field communication, it's not cellular 5G. You get my point, right? Categories and threats. Attacks. Um, all right. So the author is reinforcing examples of their terminology in this matter. Countermeasures. Okay. So here's an important concept that you need to consider. Even if you apply measures or controls to eliminate or reduce exposures, there's usually some level of exposure that remains. Whenever you see the word vulnerability, I want you to think exposure. So a countermeasure may itself introduce a new exposure. Here's a great example. How many of you run Windows Update? Most everybody, right? I do, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Have you ever seen a case where you download an update and then like things are buggy and whacked afterwards and then they have to fix the update? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All the time, right? This is where fixes need to be tested and vetted before they're applied. One example of system security that's prudent is a process where you don't just apply controls. You don't just, you don't just apply updates on mission critical systems you have an identical system that does the same function and you test it first, right? That would be a way to reduce the risk of creating a new exposure 
by loading a fix for a previous exposure. It's a contradiction in terms, but it happens all the time. Um, the goal is to minimize residual level to acceptable, acceptable levels, right? You never have perfect security unless you have a system you can't use. If it's a useful system, you're gonna have exposures. I should probably repeat that, and that might be the greatest way to close our class today. You see all these other definitions, right? So if you look at the addendum with the study guide, once again, the ones you have to know about, they're listed there. Um, I don't want you to get worried or caught up in your textbook or in these slides about whether or not a term means that we're talking about a threat consequence versus a, a threat action. I just want you to be familiar with the terms, right? Like what's the difference between interception and intrusion? I think they could, I think the authors could be a little less detail oriented and think in exposure, think of exposure in broader terms. I don't agree with the, what they've said here, sensitive data are directly released to an unauthorized entity. Hmm. Yeah, that's one way to look at exposures, but exposures are a little broader than that. So usurpation, there's a $64,000 word. Everybody repeat after me, usurpation. Usurpation. Yeah, um, a circumstance or event that results in control of system services or functions by an unauthorized, it means somebody has usurped your authority. It means you've been usurped. A usurper, a malicious agent, came in, took over, and now owns your stuff. You've been owned. That's what it means. Uh, um, we're going to try to stick to conventional or common definitions. I just thought I'd point some of this stuff out to you. We will pick up our class on Friday on slide 20, where we talk about this slide in particular, and a couple of the ones that follow. Some of the diagrams in here are worth a little time. Are there any questions before we pause today? Going well. I don't have questions. Okay. All right. Well, please review the rest of the study guide that's in there. Take a look at the addendum. Um, I have one question. Yes. So you want me to open the assignment for the data center keys, right? Yes, I'm posting your solution between now and Friday. Okay. Yeah, but you can get started with the download in the meantime. All right.